Well, hello, and on behalf of all of us at Catholic Climate Covenant, I welcome you to this first in our series of webinars for this season of creation. This one is called Catholic Social Teaching, Politics, and the Fullness of Faith. Uh, so we are uh, happy that you're all here. We have a great turnout today. My name is <clears throat> Dan Missel. I'm the Executive Director of Catholic Climate Covenant. I'll be your moderator for this hour-long webinar. Uh, before we begin, uh, let's make, take a moment to pray. This prayer is an adapted version of the opening prayer of this year's Feast of St. Francis program that the Covenant has produced. It's the, the prayer is entitled The Healing Power of Love in Action. Or the, the Feast of St. Francis program, rather, is called The Healing Power of Love in Action, Creation Care in a Time of Pandemic and Partisanship. So let us uh, take a moment to quiet ourselves, to uh, be in God's presence, uh, to give thanks for this day and for the work ahead. Loving God, creator, you fashioned us from clay and breathed life into us. We are made and loved by you. The spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty has given me life. Heavenly God, your spirit fills us with hope and lights the path to fullness of life. Hear us as we cry out to you, uncertain and afraid. The spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty has given me life. In your mercy, Lord, grant us the strength to rebuild when all seems lost and the courage to reach out to those in pain. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. Amen. Again, welcome to everybody. Uh, we had a, um, a great turnout uh, for this webinar, uh, great registrations. Uh, I think we registered almost 2,000 people, and we're hoping about half of those will actually be on the webinar today. Let me share a couple of programmatic and logistical items. Uh, the first, this is the first of our series of webinars for this season of creation, and they'll be followed by several more, including one this Monday featuring the world-renowned political scientist and director of the Climate Center at Texas Tech University, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, and Susan Hendershot, who is the president of Interfaith Power and Light based in San Francisco. So watch your email for announcements of these two or three additional webinars leading up to the Feast of St. Francis. This webinar is being broadcast uh, in webcast mode in order to accommodate the very large audience. This means that the audio is only available through your computer. There is no phone option uh, for attendees. We will have a question and answer, answer segment at the, end of this present, at, the, at, the, at the end of the two presentations. To ask a question, you will need to type it into the question box, which is in the control panel on your screen. Uh, I think it's fair to say we won't get to every question, but we will try to pick out the ones that express similar concerns and answer those. If your question is not answered and you still wish to ask it, you can do so by sending an email to info at catholicclimatecovenant.org. Uh, and note too that, as I said earlier, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you in a couple of days. So uh, during this season of Creation 2020, Catholic Climate Covenant is pleased to host this webinar series on the, on the common good and our common home for U.S. Catholics to do a number of things. One, to understand how Catholic social teaching and creation care are essential to the fullness of faith and the church's mission. Secondly, to facilitate courageous conversations about climate change and Catholic civic participation. And thirdly, to apply Catholic social teaching, including creation care, to form one's conscience ahead of the 2020 elections. So today's session, this webinar, can be seen as a foundational webinar outlining the virtue of political participation and how the understanding and practice of Catholic social teaching is also essential to living the fullness of our faith. So now uh, with those uh, preliminaries out of the way, I'm happy to introduce our two panelists. Uh, first, we are delighted to have uh, Monsignor, uh, I'm sorry, Most Reverend John Stowe of Lexington. Uh, he is a Bishop of Lexington, Kentucky. 
He's a member of the Conventual Franciscans, and he was ordained a priest on September 16th, 1995. And so, Bishop Stowe, we all hope you can take some time to celebrate your Silver Jubilee next week, and congratulations on that. Uh, he was ordained the third bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Lexington on May 5th, 2015. Since February of 2018, Bishop Stowe has also served on the Pax Christi board as their Episcopal president. Bishop Stowe will be followed by Dan DeLeo. Uh, Dan is assistant professor of the Department of Cultural and Social Studies and director of the Justice and Peace Studies program at Creighton University. Dr. DeLeo received his BA in sociology from Cornell University and his master's in theological studies and his PhD in theological ethics from Boston College. Two more things worth mentioning about Dan. One, Dan has served as a staff member and consultant for the Covenant for a dozen years and continues to be an invaluable member of our team. And secondly, it's his birthday today, and we all want to wish Dan happy birthday. So I will now turn it over to uh, Bishop Stowe uh, to give his presentation, and then we'll follow that up by Dan. Bishop, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you, Dan. Thanks very much, and thanks for the great work of Catholic Climate Covenant. I really appreciate your efforts to put the environment at the center of our concerns as people of faith and integrate it to how we express that faith. So I'm very grateful. And Dan, Dr. DeLeo, happy birthday to you. Good to be with you on this call. Um, when we talk about politics and faith, we talk about Catholic social teaching, politics and the fullness of faith, it, it just raises people's blood pressure. And that's not only in the 2020 electoral season, it's been the case for a long time. Why does politics have such a bad name and why are people of faith either resistant or just dug in in their own ideas and not often enough see the connection to their faith? I would suggest that it comes from a partial reading, even misreading, of two foundational documents. We have in the Gospel of Matthew the phrase that is often translated as render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God's what is God's, Matthew 22, 21 yeah, or 22. And then in our uh, Constitution, a foundational document for the United States, we have the, the issue of the separation of church and state, an issue that doesn't even appear in the Constitution. It's really the non-establishment clause that the government can't establish a church, nor should it inhibit the, the free expression of that church. But it's a lethal combination when you put those two things together. And so we often hear things about people that church and politics, faith and politics don't mix. I don't want to hear anything political in sermons. I don't go to church to hear about politics and all the rest of that kind of language, which we're certainly familiar now, I would sympathize with people like that if it were a matter of partisan politics that they're talking about, if it's in the realm of endorsement, if it's in the realm of browbeating people, and if it's unrelated to the rest of our living of the faith. I don't think that's what our Catholic tradition calls for. But I don't see how you can read the Gospels themselves and believe that Jesus wasn't involved in politics, especially in the stuff that we call political. The expectations about Jesus was that he would be a political messiah. He says things like, my kingdom is not of this world. Yet he does some pretty radical things like the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, crossing social lines, crossing economic status lines, and having people sit down together and break bread. Or when he speaks to a Samaritan woman at the well, um, when he touches people that are unclean on the Sabbath. He does a number of things that could be seen as political provocation, especially in the time period in which he lived with heightened expectations of the coming of a Messiah. So let me back up to that scriptural passage that we often hear is render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. I'm not a scripture scholar nor a Greek scholar, but I, I see another translation, which I think is a very good one, that says, repay unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And I think that concept of repayment both points out the hypocrisy of the person posing the question to Jesus, who has ready access to a Roman imperial coin, and yet wants to trap Jesus in whether he's going to say something supportive of the empire by using that coin and paying the taxes, or 
something radical opposed to the empire by telling people not to pay their taxes. But Jesus points out first and foremost that the person raising the question has the coin at hand and so is participating in the economy of that political environment. And then I think more importantly in that passage, what does it mean to render to God what is God's? And is there anything that Jesus would tell us is not from God in the first place? And if we repay God what is God's, then everything is in the realm of God. Furthermore, I think playing with that text a little bit, he, when he asks the, the questioner to take out a coin and says, whose image is on it? And he says, Caesar, of course. Well, the unspoken question then is, where is the image of God? And our Catholic social teaching would say, based on scripture and tradition, that the image of God is on the face of a human being. And so it's part and parcel of our teaching that everything that has to do with human life is rendered unto God or is repaid to God. And the whole political realm, the whole political sphere and the issues that are often labeled political in a demeaning way are necessarily things that relate to God and certainly relate to what our church has to say. I would use the example of Gaudium et Spes, one of the final documents of the Second Vatican Council that talks about how to be the church in the world and the very opening words from which it takes a title, its title says, the joys and the hopes, the pains and struggles of the whole human family are the joys and hopes, the pains and struggles of the people of God, this pilgrim of people of God on the journey to the kingdom. So with that kind of a broadened understanding of the realm of what is God's, the realm of what the church should be talking about, our own church's claim to where it has expertise for speaking, it's not about partisan politics, it's certainly not about public policy in its entirety, but we have something to contribute to the discussion about public policy that is absolutely essential that is absolutely critical for us. And I don't think we can make the claim that we're living our faith unless we're engaged in a process to make the better world. As we talk about creation, one of the beauties of the story of creation in scriptures and one of the beauties of our Catholic teaching about creation is that God making us in his own image and likeness invites us to be co-creators. We help fashion this world. And as Christians became not just a, a rare minority, a persecuted minority in society, but became a dominant force in society, the obligation is upon us in that, in those numbers and in that influence that we have, the obligation is upon us to form a society that looks more like the kingdom of God, something for which we pray every day, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we hear objections to politics in general, I, I think many people forget even the origins or the root of the word. It comes from polis or city and it's also the root of the word policy. We have to have some way of living together. We have to have some norms and structures that guide us. We have to have something that demonstrates how power is used, where it's held, and how it's exercised. And very often for followers of the humble carpenter from Nazareth, we have a hard time understanding or are fearful of power. There's a notion that Christianity is all about timidity, even though there's plenty of verses in the New Testament that would suggest otherwise. Think of St. Paul, you were not given a spirit of cowardice, but rather of boldness. Um, Jesus tells his followers they have to be cunning as serpents as well as gentle as doves. And I think that applies especially in the realm of the public sphere. What is our contribution in society? What is it that we can do to make a better society? Well, our church would teach us first and foremost, it's participation. We can't just opt out. We are social beings. And we are social beings that come from a rich tradition, have a rich sense of community, and therefore have something to contribute to the common good. And the common good is what should be exercised in public policy. Once in a while, when I'm doing confirmations, I like to ask the students about to be confirmed if any of them know what the word for power is in Spanish. And of course, we're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit and being clothed with power from on high. And it's easy to teach that one because it's just one letter different, P-O-D-E-R, poder, instead of P-O-W-E-R. But poder, the noun for power, is also the verb to be able to. And if we're fearful of power, then we're not able to do anything. We can't. 
my Italian immigrant grandmother used to always say she was taught she's an American, not an American, and never accepted any of us making excuses about what we couldn't do. She was proud of her new citizenship and what that implied. As people of faith and as people who find our true citizenship in heaven, we should be more uh, enthused about the power that is available to us when it's exercised in service the way that Jesus asks us to. Now, if it's because we haven't seen tremendous numbers of examples of that kind of power and service exercised in politics, um, our church would say then we should do something to make a difference about that. We should do something to change that reality, not cross our arms, sit back and complain that it's not the way we want it to be. If we don't resolve issues politically, this is the other important point. If we don't resolve issues politically, how else do we determine the use of power? By force, by violence? It doesn't seem to be acceptable in a democratic society. It shouldn't be acceptable in a contemporary society. And so politics is how we determine who has the power, how the power is used, and from our Christian perspective, how we make sure that that power is used for the good of the greatest number possible, for the good of the many. That, that's not bad. That's not something that is negative, even if it has negative connotations. When Pope Francis talks about the noble vocation of politics, some people that write me letters are absolutely scandalized by that idea that politics is not only something to be kept out of church, but it's a noble vocation. I had the very positive experience in a, the previous election cycle with a parishioner that I knew only casually who had just come to mass and was kind of lingering outside the cathedral afterwards, um, kind of giving that hint that he wanted to talk but wasn't coming forward to do so. So I eventually noticed that and invited him forward and he asked if he could meet with me for spiritual direction. And well, that was kind of an out of the blue kind of question, but he said he was running for a political office and he wanted to know how to do it without losing his soul. On the day of that of that meeting, he called earlier in the day and asked if he could bring his wife along because she's very concerned about that very issue. And it proved to be a, a very fruitful conversation and he had good reasons to be fearful of the kind of electoral process he was getting involved in, but he knew himself well enough and knew what his issues were and he was encouraged by enough very good people that he had something to contribute. And I think the church has a role in encouraging good people to work within the system and encouraging good people to bring about positive uh, change in the use of power. Well, Francis, in his address to the Joint Houses of Congress when he made his historic visit to the United States and was the first pope to address the Joint Houses of Congress, uh, said something that I think is worth listening to now in the context of, of what we're trying to do. He says, I think of the political history of the United States where democracy is deeply rooted in the mind of the American people. All political activity must serve and promote the good of the human person and be, and be based on respect for his or her dignity. He quotes, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness from the Declaration of Independence. If politics must truly be at the service of the human person, it follows that it cannot be a slave to the economy and finance. Politics is instead an expression of our compelling need to live as one in order to build as one the greatest common good, that of a community which sacrifices particular interests in order to share in justice and peace its goods, its interests, its social life. I do not underestimate the dip difficulty that this involves, but I encourage you in this effort. Now, as I was listening to those words in the halls of Congress, I was seated in an interesting spot. I was right behind the C-SPAN camera and close enough to overhear the directions that were coming over the earphones about who they were supposed to zero in on at every line that this Pope spoke. So the presumption there was that the Pope is going to upset partisans on one side or the other, probably in equal measure as he went back and forth. But I can also tell you that at the end of that address, 
I had the opportunity to go with the Congress to wave goodbye to the Pope. I was with our local congressman and a congressman from El Paso, where I had served previously. And the congressmen and women and senators were acting like little children. It was the funniest thing to see in the halls of Congress. They were excited like little kids. And there was one representative from a southern state, a female, who was jumping up and down saying, this is the greatest day of my life. I could never have imagined that scene in the halls of Congress, but Pope Francis has a way of bringing out the very best. Well, I think his vision of politics is not unattainable, maybe quite different than that which we're used to, but it's not unattainable. The US bishops every year, uh, every election year in advance of the election year issue a document about faithful citizenship, which in more recent years has been termed forming consciences for faithful citizenship. One of the important roles that the church does in the electoral process. We also note how the church brings its experience as a community at the grassroots, touching on all of these issues that have to do with the thriving of the human person, all the issues that Gaudian Spes says are of great importance to us. Um, I will stop there because I think I'm treading into Dr. DeLeo's territory now when I talk about that process, but, um, but I, I would encourage everybody to think about what we render to God as gods, and if we don't resolve things politically, how do we resolve them? You know, of course, the church, the Christian community has a role to play in politics. Bishop Stowe, thank you for your wisdom. Um, we are just enormously grateful for you taking the time out of your busy day to be with us and share with us uh, some of your thoughts, um, which are just very profound, so thank you. Uh, so let's turn it over to uh, to Dr. DeLeo, um, and I think he's sharing his screen. It looks like we're set. So go ahead, Dan. Thanks. All right. So you can see my screen before I before I start off. You're good. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I want to say um, a huge thank you to Bishop Stowe uh, for taking, as Dan said, the, the time to be with us and share his insights. Um, what I'd like to do is really supplement all of his reflections and really develop the theological foundations of both how and why Catholic social teaching and political participation are essential to the fullness of faith. And I'm going to come back to this um, phrase, the fullness of faith. But um, for those of you who saw some of the ads for um, this webinar, you've, uh, you saw kind of the teaser about um, you know, these ideas that Bishop Stowe touched on in terms of, you know, the church should stay out of politics or Catholic social teaching isn't essential. Um, and so our hope today, as Dan said, um, in this first webinar in this five-part series is really um, to equip folks to really um, have a, a deepened sense of those foundations and be able to respond to some of those things. Um, and as Paz uh, has emailed to folks, these slides will be available. So um, you'll have all of this uh, available after the webinar. Um, there are lots of ways, I think, to begin to do this, and I want to do it systematically to really um, hold together the different dimensions of the Christian tradition. And one of the best ways that I have found to do this, um, both in my research, but also with our students here at Creighton University, is using um, what, what the theologian, uh, Father Ed Vasek, has described as a schema of Christian life. And it's been um, supplemented by another theologian, Father Jim Keenan. Um, and like any model or theory or framework, um, it's incomplete and it's imperfect, but I do think um, this provides us with a kind of framework or a skeleton to try and um, connect some things together and, and to be able to build out and hang some concepts on. So, um, so this is the framework that I want to use for our conversation here today. Um, Father Basic's schema is more robust than this, but it, it, in general, I think it can be boiled down to um, five different parts. Uh, and it begins with this claim that God is love in 1 John. Um, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, God is absolute mystery. Um, that doesn't mean we can't say anything about God. We can't say everything, but we can say some things. Um, because God has chosen to reveal God's self in scripture and tradition and the life of the church. And so there's a theologian at Boston College who I'll, um, I'll mention throughout here, Father Michael Himes, and he's described this claim in 1 John that God is love is the least inadequate way to begin to speak about God. So it's insufficient, but it's the least inadequate way. Um, and it sets up the second part of the schema, which is the subsequent claim that God loves us. 
um, this radical claim that the creator and sustainer of everything that ever has been, is, or will be personally and intimately loves you, loves me, loves all of us. And in the Christian tradition, um, there are lots of different ways to speak about love, but at a minimum, I think Father Himes is right to describe love, uh, paraphrasing St. Thomas Aquinas, as willing the good of the other and acting to make that good real for him or her. So this idea of love in the Christian tradition is both willing and acting. It's how St. Paul talks about love as a verb uh, in 1 Corinthians. And it brings us to this third step, which is um, contingent on human freedom. And it's our ability to respond, to love God or not. Um, as free persons, we have the, the agency to accept or reject God's offering of loving friendship. Um, and in the Catholic tradition, when we speak about responding to God's offering, this is one of the ways that we fundamentally describe faith. Um, as the Catechism describes, faith is the adequate response to this invitation. It's the yes to God's self-offering. And it's related to the idea of spirituality, which is relationship, um, relationship with God that's begun in faith. And so in the Christian tradition, all of this um, begins with God who is love and moves us into the possibility of relationship. Um, presuming that we exercise faith and enter into relationship with God, we can, we can move to the fourth step of this game or dimension of this game, which is conversion. Um, it's the point of transformation. And it's ha it happens because love always changes us. Love never leaves us the same. And hopefully you can think about that as being true in your own life. When you think about um, spouses or partner, um, parents, friends, children, um, hopefully you are different for the better because of authentic, loving relationship. And if that's true of our human relationships, it's even more true of our relationship with God who is love. And so this is how uh, Father Vasek goes on and he describes that union with God, so friendship, leads to union with God's loves. We become more like the beloved. And so we will be inclined to love the neighbor whom God loves. Um, this is what St. Paul talks about when he speaks of putting on the mind and heart of Christ. As we enter into friendship with God, we begin to think and see and feel and hopefully act in ways that are more consistent with that love. And the fifth step or dimension of this schema is what we would technically describe as morality, but it's our lived response. Um, and so at this fifth part of the schema, we respond in and through and with love in the world. And we respond in love in, in all of the relationships for which we are created and in which we exist. And in Laudato Si, Pope Francis describes human persons as made for relationship with God, self, neighbor, and creation. And so when we speak about morality, um, this is really living out the love of God in the concrete realities of, of our everyday lives. And so hopefully you can see how this schema tries to hold together, as I said, different dimensions of the Christian tradition. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I, that I like this, especially um, with students, because it holds together um, what we're going to call the fullness of faith, uh, borrowing from Father Michael and his brother Ken Himes. Um, so we've got our schema on the left, and as I said, it holds together these pieces um, in a way that Pope Francis has reminded us. And so, for example, in Evangelii Gaudium, um, Pope Francis describes that an authentic faith, which is never comfortable or completely personal, always involves a deep desire to change the world. So faith leads to conversion, which leads to action. Um, and so faith is never personal. It's always, by definition, social. Um, and this is something that the Second Vatican Council, um, in the document that Bishop Stowe mentioned, Gaudium, it says from 1965, described um, in negative terms. Uh, and so the Council of Fathers described in number 43 that um, the split between the faith which many profess and their daily lives deserves to be counted among the more serious errors of our age. Um, in other words, conceiving or conceptualizing of faith as individual or private without having social dimensions um, is a serious error. It's an impoverished notion of the Christian faith. Uh, and in terms of um, faith, it connects it to morality, but it also does it in terms of spirituality. And so as the theologian uh, Father Richard Gula describes, this framework makes the moral life spiritual at its source. Morality is a lived response to spirituality as relationship with God. 
and it makes the spiritual life moral in its manifestations. Spirituality has to be lived out and expressed in the world. Um, as I uh, tongue in cheek say to my students, spirituality isn't just me and Jesus chilling. Um, spirituality is transformative and has to be lived out and manifest in the world through morality. And so I think this scheme or the schema and these insights bring us um, to this insight from uh, Michael and Ken Himes in their book titled Fullness of Faith, where they say an interpretation of the Christian creed that ignores the social dimension of human existence falls far short of the fullness of faith. Um, so that's where we got our title for today's webinar. Um, and it's this idea that, uh, again, faith, spirituality, and morality are all essential uh, to the fullness of the Christian tradition. And so hopefully that helps you um, have a sense of the interconnectedness, um, but it doesn't necessarily get us very far. Um, we've kind of outlined a love ethic and we can say um, love and do what you will, and that doesn't give us a whole lot of clarity in terms of um, our everyday lives. And so um, at this point, we can begin to think about Catholic social teaching as a resource. Um, so hopefully this is a review, especially for folks on the webinar, but in general, we can describe Catholic social teaching as magisterial teachings for conscientious moral discernment. So Catholic social teaching, especially in the modern tradition, um, largely began in 1891 with Pope Leo's encyclical Rerum Novarum. Um, and since then includes all of the teachings from the popes and other bishops um, trying to provide direction to people um, discerning in conscience how to live out love um, and its requirements in the world. Uh, and so as the compendium for the social doctrine of the church described, Catholic social teaching um, in one sense provides principles for reflection, it provides criteria for judgment, and it provides directives for action. Um, Father Ken Himes has described Catholic social teaching as providing ethical coordinates that we can use on our pilgrim journey, um, trying to advance towards the fullness of God's kingdom, which Bishop Stowe mentioned. Um, and so in the Catholic tradition, we can identify um, different themes over the course of um, the church's more than um, 100 years of Catholic social teaching. And, and there are a lot of ways that we can do this. This is the resource uh, provided from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops on their website. You can see the link here below. Um, and in general, the USCCB identifies seven themes of Catholic social teaching. And so um, among all the documents, we can see commitments to life and dignity of the human person, call to family, community, and participation, rights and responsibilities, the option for the poor and vulnerable, the dignity of work and the rights of workers, solidarity, and care for God's creation. And we can look at each one of these themes and unpack the foundations and look at the implications, and it's important that we do that. But equally important, we need to remember that all of these themes and indeed the entirety of Catholic social teaching is an integrated whole. Um, and this is one of the themes, really the, the refrains of Laudato Si from Pope Francis, um, where he says that it cannot be emphasized enough how everything is interconnected um, and that everything implies, uh, applies to Catholic social teaching especially. Um, we have to recognize how all of these themes are connected um, in ways that maybe we don't always recognize. And so, um, for example, in his 2010 message to the diplomatic corps, Pope Benedict XVI asked this pointed question, how can we separate or even set at odds the protection of the environment and the protection of human life, including the life of the unborn? Um, for those of you familiar with the Catholic uh, approach to climate change, this is a moral issue in part because the effects of climate change violate human life and dignity, especially of the poor and vulnerable. Um, and so we have to remember the interconnectedness of Catholic social teaching. And so um, especially when we think about care for creation, we can keep in mind, for example, this resource from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops on their website, um, that as Catholics in the fullness of faith, we're called to protect life. We have to preserve that which sustains life. And taking from uh, the subtitle of Pope Francis's encyclical, we have an obligation to care for our common home um, as an expression of our commitment to life and dignity. And this idea of caring for God's creation is itself um, one of the themes of Catholic social teaching, uh, but it's important to remember that it is essential. Um, there's a tendency sometimes to try and prioritize commitments or prioritize um, values. And again, coming out of this idea of, of interconnectedness, um, drawing from the words of Pope John Paul II in his 1990 World Day of Peace message, Christians in particular realize that their responsibility within creation and their duty towards nature and the creator are an essential 
part of their faith. Um, care for creation is essential. Uh, and so this is echoed by Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si, where he describes that living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of virtue. It is not an optional or a secondary aspect of our Christian experience. And so um, this theme of interconnectedness um, is true of all reality, but it's um, especially true of Catholic social teaching and um, as Father uh, Kenneth Michael Himes described, the fullness of faith. So, um, so Catholic social teaching can serve as a resource for moral discernment. Um, and as we think about trying to apply these principles or live out these themes, um, the church provides us with some additional resources um, and direction in terms of what this concretely looks like. Um, and in the Catholic tradition, when we, th when we think about living out love, living out love that's guided by Catholic social teaching, um, the Catholic tradition emphasizes that we have to think about this in complementary terms, and we have to emphasize that love is always expressed in two complementary ways. So this is another resource from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Two Feet of Love in Action. And as the bishops emphasize, part of love in action entails what the tradition calls charitable works. Um, and so as you can see here, this entails meeting basic needs and providing aid to individuals. So this is direct encounter and accompaniment um, with individual persons who are experiencing need in the here and now. So you can think about this as the corporal works of mercy, for example. Um, and this is incredibly important, um, again, essential to the fullness of faith. But for Catholics, this alone is insufficient because for Catholics, charitable works always have to be complemented by the other foot of love and action, which the tradition calls social justice. Um, and so as you can see here, quoted from the compendium, social justice concerns the social, political, and economic aspects, and above all, the structural dimension of problems and their respective solutions. And so um, in the Catholic tradition, social justice entails uh, reforming systems and structures and policies um, that for better or for worse, implicate human dignity um, and the, the good of all persons. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize that social justice is sometimes seen as superfluous to love. Um, but in the Catholic tradition, it's, it's essential. Um, and so this is from um, an essay that Father Kenheims and I um, published in the Journal of Moral Theology that has all of the talks from the conference here at Creighton University with the Covenant on Laudato Si last summer. Um, and so we, we note that as Pope Benedict XVI stresses in his social encyclical Caritas and Veritate, when love follows what he calls the institutional path or the political path, it is no less excellent and effective than the kind of charity which encounters the neighbor directly, charitable works. Social justice is to be understood as the political and systemic expression of love or the translation of neighbor love into institutional or structural vehicles. Um, so in the Catholic tradition, social justice is an essential expression of the love to which we are all called. Um, again, a love that responds to God's self-offering. And so again, um, thinking about our schema uh, as, a, as a kind of framework to build out and hold together these different pieces of the tradition, um, we can think about um, charitable works and social justice as an additional uh, build out of this fifth piece of the schema whereby we respond via love, morality. So in the Catholic tradition, morality entails both charitable works and social justice. Um, and this notion of politics related to social justice is something that Bishop Stowe talked about and I wanna follow up on, um, especially as, as the foundational webinar uh, in our series on political participation. Um, and his, in um, what I have to see, Pope Francis uh, gives a quote that the covenant has used as the foundation for our Feast of St. Francis program this year. And Pope, Fra Pope Francis is quoting Benedict in his encyclical Caritas and Veritate. And they both say that love overflowing with small gestures of mutual care is also civic and political. Um, again, love is political. Um, and as Bishop Stowe mentioned, the word politics is important to understand and define. So um, Bishop Stowe quoted from uh, Pope Francis's address to Congress, uh, where the Holy Father talked about politics as serving and promoting the good of persons. Um, and in general, the Catholic tradition defines politics as activities that foster cooperation and promote the common good. Um, and that notion of the common good is especially important 
when we remember that love in the Catholic tradition wills and acts for the good of others. Um, and so we, we've got this kind of bringing together of concepts whereby if love is willing and acting for the good of others, and politics is a means to promote the common good of all, then Catholics are called to participate in politics as an expression of love. Um, as Father Himes describes in his book, Christianity in the Political Order, politics matters to Christians, therefore, because it concerns the temporal well-being, or we would say the good, of God's children whom we're called to love. Um, and so this, for example, is what allows the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops in that document Bishop so mentioned, Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship, uh, to emphasize that as Catholics, we bring the richness of our faith into the public square. In the Catholic tradition, responsible citizenship is a virtue and participation in political life is a moral obligation. Um, and somewhat uh, more, uh, a little bit more pithy, um, certainly more uh, animated in many ways, Pope Francis, uh, in, a, in a homily that he gave back in September of 2013, uh, put it this way, that a good Catholic meddles in politics, um, again, as an essential expression of our Catholic Christian faith. Um, and again, this notion of political participation hinges on the idea of conscience, um, which the Catholic tradition affirms as um, in the terms of primacy and inviolability. So the conscience um, of persons is, all, is ultimately what dictates um, how we bring our faith into political life. Um, and that idea of conscience formation, especially with respect to care for creation um, and political life is, is, as I mentioned, gonna be the topic of our third webinar. But um, hopefully this gives folks, again, kind of a, a developed understanding and, and um, kind of a supplemented foundation of um, thinking about the role of faith in public life, the relationship between um, religion and society, um, and gives you maybe some of those resources, especially when we think about having courageous conversations um, to talk to people about the importance and really the necessity of, um, of bringing our Catholic faith into public life, especially through um, the action of voting. So um, with that, I will turn it back over to, um, to our presenters and uh, Dan's facilitation of uh, questions and answers. Great, thank you, Dan. Thanks so much, and uh, Bishop Stowe. Um, Let's see, I uh, am going to unmute <clears throat> um, all three of us and uh, we, can, we can begin to have a conversation. But first, let me, let me just recommend that uh, as uh, those who are listening and those who will listen later to just remind you that we do have this pledge on our website. I pledge to vote to protect life and promote the common good. And I encourage you to, to um, make your pledge um, to, to, uh, to vote this November 3rd. Um, but I also would remind people that, and, and promote this with your with your colleagues and and friends and family as well. But I also want to remind people that uh, you know voting is not no, voting is not the only political activity we should be engaged in. So I think uh, obviously November third is is one moment, but our engagement should be year round. And so we want to be able to engage with our elected officials, um, meet with them on a regular basis, whether they're local, state, or federal. Uh, bring our values to the public square, as, as our speakers have said, and, and, uh, and to do that not just on uh, election day, but on um, as many days as you can. Uh, many of the state Catholic conferences have um, uh, 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 networks of, of folks who, who, um, uh, who go and meet with members of Congress, uh, or members of the House uh, and, and the, the chambers, I guess, in their state. So we encourage you to do that as well, to get engaged with the state Catholic conference and then with your own diocese. And as often there are legislative networks within those dioceses too. So lots of ways to participate. And we encourage you to do all of that. Um, okay, so um, questions. So we have a number of questions. I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. I'll ask the uh, Bishop Stowe and Dan to be uh, succinct, I guess, in your in your um, answers. Uh, we'll start with a softball one. Um, Bishop Stowe, this is for you. Who was the person that you mentioned, a member of Congress who was so giddy that they were acting like a like a I child? wish I remember her name. Okay. I only met her at that moment and it was, it was passing. I went to look her up afterwards and never did. So. Okay, no problem. Someone had asked that question. Uh, and then uh, Bishop Stowe, this is also for you. Uh, how do you deal with the fact that as a bishop uh, in the state that has the most powerful senator, 
uh, in our country who also happens to be um, mostly in line with uh, the, the uh, Trump administration's positions, in, including um, the, the administration's um, whittling away at environmental protections. Uh, how, how do you um, manage that, if, if at all? Yeah, and I'm supposed to be succinct on this one. Well, it's been, you know, <laughs> try. <laughs> it's been a challenge to live in this state when, when both of the senators are not very helpful on, on this issue at all, and especially the the majority leader of the Senate. Um, you know, we have to keep speaking our piece, and somebody from uh, the senator's office even suggested put things in the newspaper that mention his name because he does catch those things. He does read when his name is being mentioned. So there are ways to get people's attention um, in the public square that are important. And, you know, I don't have any good example for that. I mean, that's why voting is important. And it's Great. been a challenge to have a relationship with the Senator McConnell. Great. Great. Thank you, Bishop So. Uh, Dan, I'll, I'll turn to you. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, when speaking of spirituality as relationship, could you elaborate on the concept of the web of life and the relationship with the human and the other than human? Yeah, um, yeah. there's a lot to, a lot to say there. Um, I think Francis, Pope Francis talks a lot about this in chapter six of La Dato Si when he talks about an ecological spirituality. Um, and I think it's a it's a deepened understanding, but it's really a recovery of the understanding in the Judeo-Christian tradition that we are part of creation. Um, we are unique within creation, and we um, we have a unique vocation within creation. Um, but we are we are dust and clay. Um, we are part of the natural world, and so um, we live in relationship with all of creation. Um, all of creation, which reflects the face of God and in which God um, exists as creator, but also sustainer. So in the Ignatian tradition, um, we talk about finding God in all things and, and it's precisely because God is the creator and sustainer. So, um, so I think we can talk about um, spirituality in different ways and in, and in different charisms. We can talk about you know, Ignatian spirituality or Franciscan spirituality, different ways of being in relationship with God. Uh, but I think there's a developing understanding, especially since Laudato Si, that um, you might say the fullness of spirituality entails recognizing that relationship, being in right relationship with God, the creator and sustainer, requires us to be in right relationship with all of God's creation, uh, creation of which we're part. So I think um, I think we need to recover that that piece of the tradition. Great. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Uh, let's see. Um... So Bishop Stowe, um, forming consciences for faithful citizenship, which you referenced, um, the question is, what are your thoughts about the phrase in the document, the threat of abortion remains our preeminent priority? The questioner says, in my discussions, this wording is unnecessarily confusing for the average Catholic. I voted against the inclusion of that language for that reason, but it made it in there. I do understand the logic of it being preeminent because without the right to life, the other human rights don't uh, don't come into, into existence. So I do understand it on one level, but unfortunately it gives people the permission to think it's the only one that matters. And I don't think that was the intention of the document. And it goes against other parts of the document that, that tell us not to be single issue voters. So if we do take that web of life kind of spirituality, we see the interconnectedness of all all these issues and Pope Francis has done a great job of leading us towards that. I, I think the unnecessary inclusion of that word took a step backward in that regard. Great, and sort of related to that, and I'll, I'll give this to either of you, um, you know, that I, uh, this person says, I'm in a quandary. The two most important issues for me are abortion and protecting our environment. Uh, yet neither candidate nor neither party supports both of those issues together. So how does one decide? Well, if you want me to go first, I'll sure, say yeah, that absolutely. they are both critical issues. I think an argument could be made that the creation is the preeminent issue because without uh, the, the environment to sustain human life, you can't have human life. So that's an issue. But the other important thing is we have to look at what office are we uh, 
voting people into? What office are we electing for and what is their role in that office? And we've seen what the current president can do by withdrawing from an international treaty about protecting the environment and the, the effect that that has had immediately, whereas we have unfortunately lived with abortion as interpreted it as a right since 1973, after many administrations of both parties, that hasn't changed. So um, when we look at just the, the immediacy and the role of office and, and what effect they have, I think that can weigh in on that decision. Great, thank um, you. There's yeah, a there. yeah. There's a um, a theologian um, named Kathy Caveney who um, actually Bishop Stowe will be speaking with on October 20th at a, at an event um, talking about forming consciences for faithful citizenship. And one of the things that she talks about in her theology of voting, especially in her book Laws Virtues, is that the act of voting first and foremost is electing a person. Um, and so Bishop McElroy uh, in San Diego has emphasized this um, recently that that keeping that in mind we have to first and foremost, I think, discern um, the person in terms of the qualities, the characteristics, the competency, um, the level of commitment to different values. And so um, before we get into issues, I think um, a Catholic theology of voting needs to take seriously the person um, because that's, that's really what the action of voting does, at least um, in a general election like in the United States. Um, and then when we think about issues, um, really what's at stake in issues, again, from a theological perspective, is really values. Um, the value of human life, the value of human dignity, the value of creation. Um, and so it's in terms of voting discernment, it's a process of, of discerning in conscience um, which person um, is most likely to protect and promote particular values. Um, and once we think about that, then we can think about um, how values exist in different issues and, and think about um, issues. But I, I think it's maybe a little bit of a mistake to jump right to issues um, because that's not really, um, you know, what happens in a, in a theology of voting. Um, and it's a matter of prudential judgment um, that each person is free to make in conscience when we think about um, priority issues and when we think about um, the weighing of different values. And so um, even if we were to agree on the priority of one or more values, people can come in conscience um, to different prudential judgments about what issue or issues um, ought to take priority or which issue or issues um, a particular candidate is most likely to impact um, and, and the ways, the practical ways that um, are going to be most effective to do that. So. Um, which is why I think it, we're going to talk again in that third webinar about the importance of conscience, which in the Catholic tradition, we keep emphasizing the primacy and the inviolability of conscience. Um, so Thank yeah, you. it's, yeah, there's a, there's a broader background. Well, there's a really interesting question sort of related to, to the, that uh, conscience question. So <clears throat> this, this questioner asked, does there ever come a time or situation when a Catholic should abstain from voting? One thinks of a figure like Dorothy Day, who, although she was constantly active politically, never voted. If an examination of conscience reveals a lack of moral voting choices, should a Catholic abstain or find another way of balancing priorities? That's a softball. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one would ever accuse Dorothy Day of not being politically involved. So that's right. Yeah. You know, there are there certainly are other ways of political involvement. I, I think for most of us, it, it, the most important way is voting, but it can't be the only way. I think you can make a deliberate moral choice that I'm not, I can't vote in conscience for either of the candidates presented. Now, we also should remember it's not just a presidential election coming up. We're electing the entire uh, House of Representatives and a third of the Senate. And, and there are other local issues where one's vote has an even bigger impact. So um, there's multiple levels to that voting. You can abstain from one particular office. And I think that's a legitimate moral choice. Um, the question I always pose to people when they throw that, when they present that to me is, do you want others to make the decision for you? I mean, it is our, our one expression of our voice. Thank you. Dan, any comments on that or? No, I would echo everything okay. Bishop Stowe said. Right. Uh, this is another tough question, I think, uh, and uh, Bishop Stowe, since you're, you're um, 
hitting these out of the park, I'm gonna throw this to you. Uh, how do we understand sharp, the sharp diversity of bishops in the U United States? Uh, you know, and there, there's um, uh, Bishop Strickland's uh, views, Cardinal Dolan's views of Trump, and then other people, other bishops have, you know, clearly come out in favor of, of different positions. So how do we, you know, how do Catholics understand, um, how do they how do they understand their leaders coming out with with particular um, positions on on candidates? And yeah, what, it really what, does. How should that? Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, okay. It really comes back to that question about the preeminence of the abortion issue. And while it can be seen as something very consistent with all of our tradition, uh, I can't help but see it as rather short-sighted in the in the much bigger picture of what we have to do. And as Dr. DeLeo was saying a moment ago, it doesn't take into account the character of the person or, um, or the conscience and the values that are being expressed. It's clearly unhelpful when, when the bishops give differing opinions of that, and especially when they do it adamantly and that um, you can't possibly be right if you disagree with them with that kind of tone. Now, I've been accused of that myself, and sometimes I say things um, that have repercussions beyond uh, what I'm thinking of at the present moment. Uh, I really resent the fact that the current president calls himself a pro-life candidate. Um, he could make a case for being an anti-abortion candidate, but when he uses the language of pro-life, uh, I, I found myself beyond offended by that. Nobody's pro-life if they separate children from their parents at the border, if they uh, put people in cages if they allow for the destruction of the environment, even in the handling of the COVID virus and, and having states bid against each other for the necessary protective equipment at that time. It's it's all anti-human life and anti those values. Thank you. And I think one of the things, I, I keep going back to this idea of conscience, but um, I think part of what's at stake or relevant to the question in terms of conscience is understanding a theology of the magisterium and a theology of authority um, and being able to discern between different levels of church teaching um, and the way the corresponding ways that Catholics are called um, to receive and respond to those teachings in conscience. And so um, another theologian of Boston College, Rick Gallardi, has done um, a lot of work on this. And, and especially when a when an individual bishop would um, make a judgment like some of the ones that you're describing, it's a prudential judgment, um, which in conscience Catholics are called to seriously and prayerfully consider, um, but which don't by any means preclude disagreement. So, um, you know, the magisterium is is a privileged teacher in the Catholic tradition. Um, but it's not a monarchical teacher. And I think that's something that, um, you know, Francis emphasized, especially in Amoris Laetitia, um, when he talked about the magisterium being called to form consciences, not replace them. Um, so again, this idea of conscience is, is really um, central to this entire conversation about Catholic political participation. We've just got a minute or so left. Uh, one, one last question, I think, um, uh, and hopefully there's, there's a, there's a, uh, a hopeful answer to this. Um, it seems to me there's a number of questions around uh, this divisiveness that's in our society. It seems to me that our politics, I don't think anybody could say are, are, are not divisive. I think they certainly are at this time. I think our church is also very divisive. So how do we, uh, how do we better talk with one another? How do, we, how do we communicate with one another in ways that are respectful and in ways that are um, uh, you know, thoughtful um, how do we get better at that? And how can the church, primarily, how can the church help us to, to, um, to do that better? What's the, what are the techniques? What are the methods to help us to become a little bit more, uh, to, you know, to bring the heat down a little bit and shed more light on issues rather than just blasting away at one another? That's, that's something in our local diocese that we're talking about. And in, in, in our pastoral plan, it calls for workshops on dialogue and really we have to teach listening skills um on, on the one hand in our diocese because the catholic population is such a small minority i think by by that very nature alone we have to be in dialogue with other christian traditions but it certainly extends into the the secular realm or the broader sense of the fullness of our faith and how we affect public policy we all know that that people are in their own cocoons or their own bubbles about what kind of information they get and who what sources they trust 
if we live at a time where we can't even agree on facts, it's very mm -hmm. hard to have debates. It's very hard to have real discussions. But Pope Francis's language about the encounter, you know, that you can't really encounter somebody when you have an on off button on your phone, you turn them off, it's not really an encounter. And if we're truly forced to encounter each other and really hear each other, I, I can't help but believe there's a way forward. But until we're willing to do that, or unless we're teaching people how to do that, we're gonna be stuck where we are. Great, thank you so much, uh, Bishop Stove. I think that's, uh, we, we would love to learn more about your plan in the, in the Diocese of Lexington and how, how that's going. Um, it's certainly something that's very, very needed. We're gonna let you have the last word, but uh, I wanted to just thank everyone for attending this workshop, uh, this, this webinar. Um, certainly thank Bishop Stowe and Dr. DeLeo. Uh, urge you to visit our website, uh, catholicclimatecovenant.org. I know we didn't get to a lot of questions. If, you, if your question is still burning, please email that question to us at info at catholicclimatecovenant.org and have a great rest of your day and enjoy your weekend. And again, thank you for tuning in and God bless you. Great to be with you. Thanks very much. Thank you.